Episode 409 of From Paper to People podcast brought to you by Ancestors Alive Genealogy, also known as Skelly Rellies 2021. My name is Carolyn Nee Lachlan, and I am your hostess with the mostess today. And it is a fundamental fact, an acknowledged truth the world over, that Halloween is not just for children. No. Halloween is for adults as well. And because of that, in addition to a few family stories submitted by listeners and a family story of my own, I'm providing you with recipes, with sweets, not just for children, but also for adults. Let the kids go from door to door and get their candy. Let them eat sugar until they almost explode and run around and smack into trees in your yard. But for you, Make yourself some delicious fall delicacies and enjoy them. Let the children have the candy. My first recipe for you today is from the Rutland Daily Herald in Rutland, Vermont. The issue was published on 30 October 1950, which was a Monday, and this was a page one article. It was a starred dish on the day's menu, and it was for chocolate orange bars. I'm going to read it to you verbatim. So here we go. For chocolate bars, one cup sifted all-purpose flour, one quarter teaspoon salt, one quarter teaspoon baking soda, one third cup butter or margarine or other shortening, two thirds of a cup firmly packed brown sugar, one egg, one and a quarter cup rolled oats, one half cup milk, one six-ounce package semi-sweet chocolate. For the hot orange syrup, you'll need one half cup sugar, three tablespoons orange juice, and a teaspoon of grated orange rind. Sift flour with salt and baking soda, cream shortening, add sugar gradually, blending together until light and fluffy, add egg, beat well, add flour and rolled oats alternately with milk, mixing well after each addition, Mix in semi-sweet chocolate. Turn into greased 11 by 7 by 1 half inch pan. Bake in a moderate oven, which is a 375 degree oven, for 25 minutes. And then for the hot orange syrup, mix sugar and orange juice in a small saucepan, bring to a boil, remove from heat, and add grated orange rind. Pour over baked mixture before cutting into bars. When cool, cut into 24 bars. Sounds fabulous to me. They also wanted to remind us that an estimated 400 rural people are killed and 800 to 1,000 injured each year by lightning. Thanks, Rutland Daily Herald. Our first audience member submission today is from Andrew Martin. He has a podcast called Family Histories Podcast, which you can find at familyhistoriespodcast.com. You can find him on Twitter at Family Hist Pod. And otherwise, he's got a great story for us, so listen in. Hello, Carolyn. It's Andrew Martin here from the Family Histories Podcast, and I've got a spooky story for you that I think involves one of my relatives. It begins on, yes, 31st of October, but in 1866. In the cathedral city of Ely, which is about 12 miles north of Cambridge here in England. On this night, Jeremiah Newell, that's a common surname, had been drinking in the Royal Oak public house on Back Hill. He'd had a great time and he'd got drunk and he made his way around the corner to Potter's Lane. Potter's Lane was quite a poor part of Ely at that time and he chanced across a nice, soft, warm bed right there in the street. In reality, it was a steaming warm heap of manure. It's reported he slept there 
and I quote, was seized with cramp and died suddenly. An inquest was held and he was buried a couple of days later. By the 17th of November, though, according to the residents of Potter's Lane, Jeremiah was back and was even reported in the Cambridge Chronicle newspaper. Jeremiah's ghost was first seen by an elderly lady who then told her neighbour, but the neighbour didn't believe her. The next night, they looked again, but this time they both saw him. Again, the Cambridge Chronicle reports that one of the ladies fainted, but the other, more emboldened, called out to him. The ghost shook its head and beckoned her to follow him. But as she states, twasn't a bit likely, and a most indecent thing to require. Apparently a cockerel crowed and Jeremiah vanished. Also, apparently, the next day, some of the residents of Potter's Lane were threatening to leave, so plans were made to call a member of the clergy to lay the ghost. There's no report to say whether that did or didn't happen. Obviously, as a genealogist, I can't just leave that story there, so I bought a copy of the death certificate. Jeremiah Newell did indeed die on the 31st of October in 1866 at Ely. He was aged 50 years. Sadly, the location of the death isn't noted. It just says Ely. It doesn't say Potter's Lane. It doesn't say the Royal Oak. But it does state that he died of, and I quote, congestion of the brain occasioned by drunkenness, exposure to cold, a fall while in a state of intoxication. Sadly, the inquest has not survived. Whilst I'm not 100% sure he is a relative, his location time period, surname, and even his name, Jeremiah Newell, makes it highly likely that this supposed ghost is somewhere haunting my tree, and possibly the modern residents of Potter's Lane. Boom! That one was ghost approved. And now, I'm going to scare you with a recipe. It's not really that bad, but it's from the Tribune in Scranton, Pennsylvania, dated 26 October 1934, which was a Friday, and it was on page 10. Halloween recipes. Other Halloween recipes not included among those awarded prizes, but deserving of mention, are printed below. Black and Gold Cobbler, submitted by Miss Margaret C. Young of 1510 Lafayette Street. One and a half cups cooked, sweetened, dried apricots. One and a half cups pitted, cooked prunes. Half a cup of granulated sugar. One teaspoon of cinnamon. Three quarters of a teaspoon of salt. One cup combined apricot and prune juice. A tablespoon butter. And pastry or shortcake dough. Whatever your favorite recipe. Combine the fruits, sugar, cinnamon, salt, fruit juices, and butter. And bring to a boil. Pour into shallow baking pan. Cover with strips of pastry or with short cake dough on top. Brush top with milk. Bake 20 minutes in a very hot oven. Serve hot or cold with plain or whipped cream. Mmm, tasty. And speaking of tasty, I have a recipe for you. Did you like that segue? This is something that my mother used to make for me on demand because she was very sweet and I was kind of obnoxious. When I was in college, she would say to me, well, you're coming home for Thanksgiving or you're coming home for Christmas. What would you like me to make you while you're here? And then we would pack as many delicious foods into that break as is humanly possible. She was an amazingly gracious woman, my mother. One of the things that I always asked for was apple crumble, aka apple crisp. And it is absolutely delicious. It serves four to six people. The recipe comes from someone in Australia, which is kind of interesting because I didn't know mom knew anyone there, but she got it from Australia. And it is fantastic. The taste of fall. And it's a wonderful way to cap a meal or to have with coffee or something like that, you know. So let those kids have the Milky Ways. You have some apple crumble instead. And here's what it takes. Two pounds of tart green cooking apples, such as Granny Smith, although she used to mix in Macintosh apples because they were different textures and had slightly different flavors. So it gave it more range. And what you do with those apples is you peel them, you core them and you slice them. Then you need a quarter of a cup of apple cider, 
three quarters of a cup of flour, a half a cup of sugar, a half a cup of packed brown sugar, three quarters of a teaspoon of cinnamon, and I go for it. I get the Vietnamese cinnamon. Oh, it's so good. A half a teaspoon of nutmeg, a pinch of salt, and a stick of butter or margarine. Put the apples in a shallow two-quart baking dish. Pour the cider over. Combine flour, sugars, cinnamon, nutmeg, and salt in a medium bowl. Cut in the butter until the mixture is crumbly. You can cut in butter either by using two butter knives and cutting it crossways with the stick of butter lying in the flour so that it gets cut up into little pea-sized pieces or smaller and it's blended well with the flour. Or you can use a pastry cutter and I'm not sure how many people have those these days, but it's a handle that fits in your palm crosswise so that you're hanging onto the handle and it has a series of wires that come down in a half circular sort of oval loop from either end of that handle so that you can mash down and it will automatically start to cut that butter into pieces. So what you do is you cut it in until the mixture is crumbly and then you spread that over the apples. You bake it in a preheated oven until apples are tender and the topping is light brown, which is 40 to 45 minutes in a 350 degree oven. Serve it warm. And if you want it the way that we had it, top it with ice cream. We liked it with vanilla ice cream or you can put whipped cream on there. Mascarpone wouldn't be a bad idea. It is a delicious way to celebrate the apples of autumn. Our next story was submitted by Di Davis. You can find Di's work at Genial Cumri, which is spelled G-E-N-E-A-L-C-Y-M-R-U. And you can find Di on YouTube and Twitter. And Di has a Patreon in case you want to support Di's work. Here is Di's submission. Mountains are magical places, tall and imposing, blanketed in a heavy fog. The mountains are a place just at the edge of our world, not quite tamed by human settlement and activity, but not fully wild and unknown. The Brecon Beacons in Wales contains countless mysteries from over the millennia. For the good, the mountain can serve as a place of refuge and hope. As the stories say, Owain Glyndwr, the last military leader of the Welsh independence movement, disappeared into the mountains in 1412, vowing to one day return to see Welsh independence from the English conquerors realized. The mountain also takes in those who are not so good. Our story today is about one of those less than good people, the Reverend William Williams, rector of Llan Harry. Reverend Williams was a grandson of my six times great-grandparents, and he came from a very privileged background. His father was a landowning farmer of 150 acres, two of his brothers were also clergymen, and his two brothers-in-law were also clergymen. He was chosen as rector of San Harry in the county of Glamorganshire, South Wales, sometime around 1857 and moved there from his home in Pencarrig, Camarthenshire, also in South Wales. Our story begins on a damp, chilly Wednesday in April 1873, about 15 years into his position at San Harry. Reverend Williams has just mysteriously disappeared, without a trace. The papers quickly declare it just that, a mysterious disappearance. And once his absence starts to concern his friends, they begin their search, day and night, through the surrounding hillsides and on the mountain. The rest of the villagers seem less alarmed with his disappearance, and continue about their daily routines as usual. Rumor has it that Reverend Williams and some of the villagers were embroiled in some sort of conflict, and the papers pick up on this, but they never come out and say that his parishioners did it. Reverend Williams wasn't necessarily disappeared by anyone, he just disappeared into the mountain in some mysterious way. Late into the afternoon, on the following Sunday, the searchers finally come upon Reverend Williams. At the peak of the mountain, Gilvach Goch, starved, 
but still alive. He had taken refuge at the top of the mountain and lain there without food or water. His friends quickly bundle him up in a blanket and carry his feeble and shivering body back down to the village, where they call on the local doctor to tend to him. Their efforts were not in vain, and Reverend Williams makes a full recovery. We don't know what conflict there was between Reverend Williams and his parishioners up to that point. We don't know why he was almost swallowed up by the mountain. But it's not four years later that we learn what kind of person Reverend Williams was. Times were dire for the villagers of San Harry and across Wales in 1887. Rising rent, poor income from the sale of their crops, and a general depression in agriculture made for a time of general desperation. The tithe rate, or the money each household had to pay Reverend Williams as a representative of the Anglican Church in San Harry, was a full one-fifth of their farm rents. The amount was far too high, and not to mention that a large proportion of those paying didn't even attend the Anglican Church. They were nonconformists, independents, congregationalists, and Methodists. The parishioners learned from their last conflict with Reverend Williams that you can't always depend on the mountain to save you and solve your problems. So this time they were determined to stick together. The parishioners met and came to an agreement that they would demand a reduction of the tithe rates and accept nothing less than 12.5% reduction. Otherwise, they would give him nothing. So they drafted a letter suggesting a 20% reduction in the rates, prepared to negotiate with Reverend Williams. Reverend Williams' response was this, I will allow you 5% and no more. Had you asked in a humble and peaceable way for 10%, I may have felt more for you, but you demanded 20% rather than come to me on a bended knee. Reverend Williams refused to meet with the parishioners and also refused to even send his collector to discuss things. Upon the tithe collections, the parishioners paid the collector their dues, minus the 12.5%. The collector told them that if they didn't pay the full amount, he wouldn't accept anything, so the collector ended up leaving with 32 pounds of the full 280 pounds. This conflict continued on for a considerable amount of time, and the impact of Reverend William's actions went beyond the small village of San Harry. In a meeting later that year, on the decline of the Anglican Church in Wales, Reverend Williams was specifically named as contributing to that decline. The work of Reverend W. Williams, San Harry, and others, rejecting a reasonable reduction in tithes due to the depression of agriculture, together with the abusive manner of behavior towards the tithe payers by the church authorities in various neighborhoods, has produced a very strong anti-ecclesiastical sentiment in a large part of the country. Unfortunately for the parishioners of San Harry, Reverend Williams lived for another 10 years after the tithe wars, working for a total of 40 years in the parish. Upon his death, what some called a sham election was held for the incoming rector. The polls were open for a total of 12 minutes, from 6.15 in the morning to 6.27 for voting. But it was the nonconformist villagers who packed the church pews to do so. They ended up electing an Anglican rector who was sympathetic to their cause, much unlike the now dead and disgraced Reverend Williams. Following his death, there was no announcement of his passing. There was no recounting his life, no celebrating his 40 years in the parish. He's just forgotten. So the morals of the story are these. Be a good person and don't exploit the people that you hold power over. Don't give the mountain a reason to claim you too. And secondly, if the mountain fails to liberate you, come together as a community to fight the powers that choose to oppress you. Sounds like the monster's approved. And now I have another recipe for you. I don't know about you, but when I think of buttercream icing, I usually think of something that is 
raw, if you will. It's whipped up. It isn't cooked. But my mother had a way of icing spice cake and apple cake that was absolutely the best thing in the world. And it's one of the recipes that she made sure to hand down to the rest of us before she passed on. So I'm giving you an apple cake recipe that was my grandmother's and then the icing that should go on it. But I'm telling you this icing, you can put it on a boxed mix of spice cake and it will send you to heaven. So first, my grandmother's apple cake, one and a quarter cups of vegetable oil, just don't use corn oil. That's a big strict rule here. And you're also only supposed to mix this by hand. Don't use a mixer, which is good to know. Two cups of sugar, two eggs well beaten, three cups of flour, a teaspoon of baking soda, a quarter of a teaspoon of salt, one teaspoon of vanilla, a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon, and three cups of diced firm red apples. Now, that was in the days when red apples still had flavor. <laughs> so maybe not your traditional red apples. Macintoshes are a little wet, but think about what you like and use what you like because that's the important thing. It's you and it's your food. Mix the oil and the sugar. Mix together the dry ingredients and add to the oil-sugar mixture. Add the remaining ingredients. The batter will be quite stiff. Bake in a greased loaf pan or oblong cake pan or tube pan. Cake freezes well. Top with powdered sugar or cream cheese icing. But remember what I said, I'm taking you to heaven for All Saints Day. Burnt butter icing. So simple. A third of a cup of butter. A pound of powdered sugar. Five to six tablespoons of milk two teaspoons of vanilla, and a quarter teaspoon of salt. You melt the butter in a saucepan. Heat it until it's golden brown, stirring constantly. Remove the pan from heat. Stir in the powdered sugar, the salt, and the vanilla. I usually put the vanilla in first because it has alcohol in it, and it gives the alcohol a chance to burn off a little bit. Then stir in enough milk to make the icing spread easily. That's it. That's all it is. But the cooked quality of the butter, I'm telling you, it makes a difference that is absolutely religious in its nature and power. Our final story is that of my second great-granduncle, Chrysostom McLaughlin. It's not a ghost story, but it is a sad story of a life that was wasted. Chrysostom was born on October 12, 1846 in Farmington, which is in the northwest corner of Pennsylvania. His parents were Irish immigrants from the north of Ireland. Chrysostom's father, Charles, and his first wife, my third great-grandmother, Elizabeth McCall, had arrived in the area in about 1830, as did five of Charles's brothers and one of Charles's sisters eventually. Charles had three children by Elizabeth, who apparently died in childbirth in 1838, and then had six more with his second wife, Margareta Downey, who died in 1848 also in childbirth. The oldest sibling was Sarah, a sister born in Ireland before the crossing, who never married. She served as Charles's housekeeper and right hand, helping to raise her siblings. Clarion County was mountainous, lush, with forests and rivers, and ripe for farming. Charles was a farmer and a lumberman, as were many in the area. Others worked in smelting and, when the boom arrived, in pumping oil. Chrysostom started on the farm, but was a coal miner for most of his relatively short life. The first notable fact of Chrysostom's life is that in 1877, he fathered a daughter with a single woman named Margaret Walsh. She was 20 years old. He was 31. Margaret named their daughter Mary and remained with her own parents, while Chrysostom's father, Charles, adopted Mary, or so says the 1880 census. Chrysostom was living in the same household, but apparently may not have been personally claiming responsibility. It looks like his father and his sister Sarah, who was also living in the household, were answering for Chrysostom's actions. Later in life, Mary carried the McLaughlin name as her middle name and went by Walsh until her death. In 1886, Chrysostom, whom my cousins referred to as a ladies' man, had a son with another single woman, Mary Magdalene Steiner. He was 40, she was 19. 
Their son, Peter, was raised by Mary Magdalene's parents and did not carry the McLaughlin name either. There is currently no evidence that Chrysostom was involved in his son's life in any way. Chrysostom's birth family suffered the loss of one son, Marcus John, in the Civil War, two mothers, both in childbirth, and another son, Chrysostom Christian, to disease at age 16. They obviously knew sorrow, but for the era, no more so than other families. I've never understood then why Chrysostom's life was in such disarray and why he continued to live with his father even after his 30th birthday. But recently, I found items about his death that clarified his life a lot. My family knew that Chrysostom challenged his father's will in 1890, two years after his father's death. There was some speculation that Sarah, eldest sister and executrix, was trying to break the will to benefit her remaining full brother, Charles, my second great-grandfather. Perhaps there had been hard feelings between the two sets of half-siblings. Perhaps Charles had PTSD. Charles had fought for Pennsylvania in the Civil War, was wounded, and returned to battle just in time for Gettysburg. But it turns out, reading between the lines of newspaper accounts, PTSD was not the problem. Chrysostom was. Sarah wanted to prevent Chrysostom from receiving his inheritance because in addition to fathering two children out of wedlock, Chrysostom had the disease of alcoholism, and she thought he might drink the money away. Much to Sarah's dismay, I'm sure, Chrysostom won the case, receiving an inheritance that he'd likely put to waste. I didn't know about this until I found two local newspaper articles, but Sarah was right to be concerned about his fate. According to the local paper, the Clarion Democrat, there had been almost 15 inches of snow in the forest-covered hills of Clarion in December of 1893, so it must have been cold on December 30th, the day that Chrysostom died. The Clarion Democrat printed two reports on Thursday, January 4th, 1894. The first report on page 5 states, Chrysostom McLaughlin, a coal miner by occupation, who lived alone in a shanty near Freiburg, was discovered in his quarters in a dying condition last Saturday morning, and although prompt effort was made to resuscitate him, he did not regain consciousness, but died the same day. His death is attributed to strong drink and exposure. The other account, not as kind, was in the gossip section on page 8, and read, A rumor came to town on last Sunday evening that Chrysostom McLaughlin was found dead in his bed last Saturday morning. It is reported that he was under the influence of liquor for several days before his death. He lived near Snydersburg. Chrysostom's will was executed by his full brothers, Thomas and Edward McLaughlin. I haven't seen the will, so I don't know how he disposed of his property, or indeed how much was left by 1893. I don't know whether he acknowledged his children or left anything to them. I hope to see that along with Chrysostom's death certificate soon. Once his father died in 1888, Chrysostom had to move out of a family farm. Unfortunately, there is no extant 1890 census for the area, so it's hard to know some of the finer points of who lived where in the year of the court case. But by living alone in Freiburg, he remained a stone's throw away from most of his siblings and all of his cousins, even as he had alienated some or many with his choices and in his disease. But not all relationships surrounding Chrysostom were bad, apparently. His son Peter Steiner had an aunt, Margaretha Steiner, who was a year younger than Peter. Peter and Margaretha grew up together as siblings, and Margaretha married one of Chrysostom's nephews, George Edward McLaughlin, whose father, Thomas, was one of Chrysostom's executors. This tells me that overall, the families did manage to get along. As a researcher, I like the morbid, I have to say. It's one of my strengths and one of my failings. My main takeaway from this story is that Chrysostom was an alcoholic who couldn't stop drinking who made bad decisions throughout his life that deeply affected others, and who ultimately was too drunk to keep the stove lit in a cold and snowy winter. As a result, he died just three years after winning the court battle that awarded him an inheritance worth $64,948.17 in today's money. 
In my work, I always focus most on the family members who were single or those who lived deeply tragic lives. I'm particularly intrigued by those with alcoholism or mental illness. My cousin shared a photograph with me. It's a portrait of Chrysostom from roughly 1870, and he looked to be quite the dandy. But the paper trail shows that he was a mess. His daughter, Mary McLaughlin Walsh, never married and never left the area. She was a nurse. His son, Peter Steiner, married Ida Schill and had five children. He never left the area either. He only seems to have taken after Chrysostom in one way. He, too, was a coal miner. Both Mary's and Peter's death certificates show that Chrysostom was their father, but beyond that, his effect on his children's lives is unclear. Such was the life and legacy of Chrysostom McLaughlin, died at age 47, one of many tragic figures in my family tree. That last story was so depressing that the monsters and the ghosts don't even have anything to say about it. So we're going to leave on a positive note with a couple of recipes from a 1935 newspaper for pumpkin things. It says new pumpkin recipes. This is the first time for new pumpkin recipes when the housewife and nearly everyone else becomes obsessed by the thought of any pastry in which the golden fruit of the pumpkin is offered. While perhaps there is nothing better than the well-made old-fashioned pumpkin pie, many women like to know some new ways of making the historic Thanksgiving dessert so they can have it oftener during the pumpkin season. Oftener. From the Cincinnati Inquirer on 11 October 1935, here are the recipes. Caramel pumpkin pie or tarts. Combine one and a half cups of canned pumpkin, although of course you can bake your own pumpkin and use that fresh, which I highly recommend. One third of a cup of sugar, a few grains of nutmeg, a half a teaspoon of cinnamon, a half a teaspoon of ginger, and a half a teaspoon of salt in the top of a double boiler and heat it. Add three beaten eggs, caramelize two-thirds of a cup of sugar, then dissolve in one and a half cups of hot milk, and add to the pumpkin. Pour in pastry-lined pie tin or tart shells. Bake in a 450-degree oven for 10 minutes, then 325-degree oven for 30 minutes, or until the knife comes out clean. Serve topped with whipped cream if desired, one pie, or eight to ten tarts. That sounds fabulous, but there's more. Pumpkin mallow pie. Who could say no to that? Mix two cups of canned pumpkin, seven-eighths of a cup of sugar, one teaspoon of salt, one teaspoon cinnamon, and one and a quarter teaspoons ginger in the top of a double boiler, and heat until sugar is dissolved. Add three beaten eggs and a cup and a half of hot milk. Cut 16 marshmallows in quarters and spread in the bottom of pastry-lined pie tin. Pour hot pumpkin mixture over and bake having oven at 425 degrees for 5 minutes, then at 325 degrees for 30 to 35 minutes or until knife comes out clean. One pie. One marshmallowy pie. And finally we have... Brazilian pumpkin tarts, which actually have nothing to do with Brazil, but here we go. Heat one and a half cups of canned pumpkin, three quarters of a cup of maple sugar, one half teaspoon of salt, three quarters teaspoon of cinnamon, and one teaspoon ginger in the top of a double boiler. Add two beaten eggs and a half cup of hot milk and three quarters of a cup of chopped Brazil nuts. There's your Brazil. Pour into pastry-lined tart tins and bake 450 for 5 to 10 minutes, 325 degrees, until knife comes out clean. And that's 8 to 10 tarts. So for that period when it's 325 degrees, judging from the other two recipes, you're in the 30 to 35 minute range for baking at 325 the best thing that you can do when you have a recipe in front of you and it's an older recipe and it doesn't state exactly how to do something is to Google similar recipes and to use their procedure. So I didn't even have to Google. I just looked on the page. And with that, we close out another episode of Skelly Rellies. 
And I thank Di and I thank Andrew for contributing. I thank you all for listening. And please think about contributing a story of your own next year because I really like featuring the things that you do. Happy Halloween. And remember, do your research. Don't let those Jeffries rattle your bones. And above all, expect surprises. (laughs) 